Hello, uh, everybody. Here we are again. This is Ben Alameda talking about cylinder heads again, basically about the intake ports. Like I said before, I pay more attention on the intakes more than I do the exhaust. Not downplaying the the part of the exhaust, which is also significant, as I can show you here. But um, what we're going to talk about today is. Uh, how many times have you heard somebody say, you know what, I have this 340 CFM intake port and we drive at the track and later on we switch to this other junk cylinder head that's only flowing 300 or 320, 20 or 40 CFM down, the doggone thing went faster or just as fast. What happened? Well, if you ask a lot of people that question, Identical flow heads, what happened? Could you answer it? And a lot of them would say, yeah, because, you know, flowing heads or uh, the air, the, you know, the, right here in the combustion chamber is more homogeneous or uh, more combustible, so on and so on. A lot of reasons, okay? But if you can pinpoint, you flow one head, 340, and you flow this other head here, 340 as well, on the flow bench, why did the other, the other one run faster or the one with a lower flowing uh, capability when a flow bench ran just as fast? The secret is port recovery. Hardly anybody talks about port recovery. How fast does that intake port in a short way recharge itself? As soon as the intake valve closes, it have the capability to stack a lot of flow column again, dense and everything. And then when the next valve happens with the flow charge coming in, artificially, artificially supercharges itself into the, to the combustion chamber. Excellent, excellent scenario. But nobody talks about port recovery. Everybody talks about, hey man, 340 CFM, 300, 80 CFM, that's going to kick the 340 out the door, but no, uh, there's a lot more answer to that and I'm going to try to uh, explain the scenario, okay? Lower flow equals less horsepower, not true. Now, high port versus low port recovery rates. The standard Ford Chevy ports look somewhat like this. When the intake valve opens up, all the column charge comes in. You know, a predetermined velocity could be good, could be fair. Okay, so they come in. As soon as the valve closes, how fast the uh, column here stacks up? Once the because there's always an opposite equal reaction. When the valve closes, the flow column sees it and hits a freaking door. <laughs> when it hits the door, they start to stack up. And then the other column come in, it starts adding up. It could be adding up all the way here or sometimes all the way there. That's why you have this, this like the TPI manifold, good looking, like 1985 IROC Zs, beautiful manifold, you know, center, center throttle body, and then the, the ports come in because they're trying to take that, that um, what do you call that, uh, column charge or uh, the tuning, the wavelength tuning. Uh, into the port and make it play a part into the whole uh, scheme of things. But anyway, so here it recovers as well. But here's the situation that happens. On this 340, 360 head, on this, I've experienced this many times, this is on the flow bench, 340, 360 CFM. Impressive. This one here, high port, smaller port, if you look at, only flows 283, 285, well, let's say, say 300, to make it seem like a little bit better. So it's about 40 CFM down. Here, when the intake valve closes, the column stacks up, right? But since it's a slower speed, let's just say it stacks up to half. Let's just say. Here, because it's a high port, even though it's lower CFM uh, on the flow bench, the velocity is much faster, okay?
So once the intake valve closes, it stacks up here rapidly, real quick. As opposed to here, lower velocity, it doesn't stack up as quickly. Here, it stacks up big time. Now, when both of them opens up, the intake valve, since this is a bend, it takes a while for that bend to go down, for the flow to go around that bend and come down and discharge into the combustion chamber. Here, it's downhill. It's like this. It goes in rather easily. And what's with that is that when it goes in, the other column charges, you know, come in just as fast and just supercharge that combustion chamber and you're getting more in there, even though on the flow bench it's less. But actually, with the port recovery and the velocity coming in, it's ingesting a lot more. And then I'll explain to you the relationship of that and how this becomes even more of an advantage. Here, it's slower. It may not discharge itself completely of everything that it's capable of getting in because of this bend. So once the intake valve closes, it slowly recovers. Lower velocity, that's high velocity port. It recovers so much faster. So in actuality, the column of stored fuel and air here is much denser and much more for every valve event. And it'll be more shoved in there. Whereas here, because it was a lower air speed and everything, it may just go to here compared to here. It may get up this far. It depends. We're just, you know, uh, giving it uh, a simplified version without going through all the mathematical things, which really is a good way of doing it, but it just confuses a lot of you because this is obvious, okay? One has less bend and this is more bend. You know that's gonna flow more, correct? So given a smaller port, it'll flow because the angle, it doesn't slow down the airspeed coming in. Now, Intake flow and strong overlap, here we go. Strong overlap of the exhaust port. Now, once this is, discharges the recovered, once the port recovered and opens up maximum flow, it discharges into the combustion chamber or the cylinder. And once the intake and exhaust valve on the overlap phase, the pistons chase an exhaust valve real quick, all right? And the exiting gases will yank this. Okay, actually go like this, and some will go out that way. Same thing here, right? And go that, or sometimes just some will, will go that way. Now, the issue that we're looking at is the port speed of this, this high uh, exhaust angle, just like this high intake angle. Low intake angle, low exhaust angle. Actually, I made this look pretty. It's actually a lot lower than that. Now, the velocity of the exiting gases right behind it is lower pressure or absence of pressure, right? It reflects on the intake and gives it a good yank. And go, some will escape and go to the exhaust. Just a fact of things, it happens. You know, fuel, air to draw through, it pulls that. But since this is a lot stronger signal, remember this exhaust parts, 265, to, a lot of them high, some are 240, average, for this high port SC1s and SB2, they're about there, 240, 250. Standard Ford Chevrolets, 180, 200. You're happy with that. It wants 220, you're doing a real good job. Still nothing compared to that. Meantime, the high velocity coming out of here, okay, downstream, creates a lot of pressure, a low pressure here. And the acts on the intake a lot stronger than this would. Therefore, the yanking capability of this exhaust port intake, exhaust port combination, is not as good because it has to bend. And then this, this flows this way instead of high. Okay, they'll, 
they'll have a very high air speed on the exhaust and get a real good yank here. It's bent, so it's kind of slow, and the reflected signal, pulling signal, is not as good. Whereas here, it's close to excellent. That's why sometimes on the old head, you're looking at 75% to 80% intake to exhaust ratio. Here, you bring it down to 53%. We'll talk about that again on uh, the, one of the future videos. I'll touch on that quickly. Because if you have this 75% and you apply to 75% by putting a bigger exhaust valve and bigger ports and everything, you're going to pull too much. Your column charge, instead of catching it here, will go out the exhaust. That's why you need to limit this bad boy. Okay? He, he can be something like a, a big dog that loves to eat. He'll eat everything. Even the other puppies will starve. <laughs> it was just a joke. Anyway, uh, 53 to 55%, no more. Okay? Here, you're okay at 75, 80%, because you need that strong reflected uh, signal or wave to pull on this. Not as, not as much here, because you can overdo it and pull, pull raw air and fuel out the exhaust. Now, um, ideal port shape and volume will recover faster. Here we go. If this port was way too big, all right? Even though there's a high port angle. If it's big, big port means slower airspeed. Slower airspeed means as soon as that valve closes, the stacking or the recovery gets slower, slower. <laughs> okay? Now, if it's the ideal port, perfect for the CID that you're running, it will recover fast and stacks up. And then the next one has a large column. But if the port is too big, the signal is slow, the air speed is slow. And you know, big ports, everything just slows down. It looks impressive. But if it's slower, guess the recovery rate here. It would be cut down compared to, to a, a fast acting port. That's why when you have a lazy port, you have uh, poor low speed response, uh, you know, every time you go to second gear, to third gear, and third to fourth, you kind of like bog a little bit, and they start pulling again. A signal of too much port, no velocity. Here, the same problem. When you make it too big, and then the bend, oh gosh. So not only are you trying to pull your recover, your recovery, your port recovered uh, column around this bend, you're not going to get a, a good uh, job doing it. Here, it's simpler. It's one simple, less abrupt turn as opposed to this thing. Now, uh, of course, we touch on that. Intake, intake with superior velocity will recover faster. Okay, of course, shape and volume, we talk about that. The shape and the, the volume, once it's too big, port velocity goes down, your recovery rate suffers as well. Now, exhaust valve position in relation to the intake valve. Preferably lower in the chamber. Okay, here we're showing on the overlap, but about the same distance. Some of those gas will go in, go like that, and go out. Or some will just go like this and out. So, your mechanical compression ratio, which is important, it's a mechanical, it's a number that you, you calculated, that doesn't really matter. What matters is when there's an intake valve close in the whole stroke uh, uh, travel, they'll determine your, your compression as, as much as the diameter. What you're looking at is the dynamic um, compression that's caught here. Because if you, you open up during overlap, some of the gases are in here and some go out the exhaust, you're losing your dynamic compression here. You mean your, 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 the, uh, the charge that you caught, some bleed out of the exhaust. Same thing here, okay? If some of that stuff bleeds off, you may have to say, oh, I got 11 in water, I have 16 in water. Yeah, you really don't have that. <laughs> some of it went out the exhaust. Now, when I said in relation to the intake, here it shows the exhaust valve is sunken a little bit. It's not detriment. 
when you sink an intake valve, you're going to cut um, the airflow and you're going to lose some power, okay? Because your CFM will drop when you sink the valve into the chamber. The exhaust, it's under pressure. You can sink it within reasonable amounts. It's up to you how far you want to go. I'm not going to tell you guys that. Uh, common sense tells you you don't go too deep. You don't go too deep. But enough that previously you're at equal height and some of them will go out. But if you sink the valve a little bit further in, it's further closer to, to the seat so that when they come in, they have, don't have a tendency to go out the exhaust. They go under. They go under here. So your column charge is caught instead of going through the exhaust. Very important. Now, high exhaust port angle produces faster exiting speeds and more pulling reflected on the intake valve. Yes, I did say that earlier. Now faster, because there's a high port, the faster speeds of the exhaust velocity has a very, very strong signal on the intake. Remember, a lot of people think the piston does more of the injecting of the, uh, or the drawing in of the, of the air and fuel mixture. Not so, okay? Because if there's no overlap and the valve is closed, and the, remember, when the exhaust is closing and the intake starts to open, the piston is still going up, okay? So what is that doing? If the piston is going up, don't you think that this will, the piston going up will force the air back in? back out the exhaust? No. The overlap reflects that that signal and it starts pulling hard even though if the piston going up it's pulling hard and pulling the intake column. Now you have the reflected uh, wave here where recovery rate piston going up the intake valve opens up it goes you shoves right in exhaust pulls them and the piston comes up to TDC and then it starts to come down then it takes over. But there's already enough inertia and the column is already moving. Because if you have no overlap and you only, <laughs> okay, without this, if the piston's coming up, it'll back, it'll back flow, correct? The only way it doesn't back flow to you is because the exhaust is creating a signal to keep them coming in. Now, it, without overlap, when the piston comes up, right so you're trying to keep it from back flowing out and then the piston starts to come down and the intake valve opens up guess what too late too late there's a lag that happens piston's going down rapidly and this guy here is going to have a lag time before it starts flowing in by the time you get to the the, the best ang crank angle to to pull on the mixture it's too late Okay, so what you're trying to do is that the overlap anticipates the intake valve opening in relation to the piston. So with those two open, it creates a signal, starts pulling strong and the piston still coming up. And then as soon as uh, that's done, the piston starts to come down, the column is already moving. Pretty doggone good. And there you go. So anyway, to try to wrap this up, even though this 283 CFM doesn't flow as good as this 340 or 360 CFM. You got to take into account the two, his dancing partner, okay? That is such a very good exhaust um, performing port and reflects a very strong signal here. The very strong signal creates a column to start going into the cylinder at a rapid rate. Here it's not as much because you have a bend and a turn. Okay? So, take into account port recovery because it yanked it so fast, the port recovery stacks up almost instantaneously. Okay? What it means is that once it depletes everything here, you have vacuum, of course, you know, you're trying to pull, you know, half an inch or whatever at high speed, you know no more than half an inch, I think, uh, then you know you have a pressure differential and you're going to pull something out of the Venturi or the injectors or whatever. You're able to, to bring that column in as soon as the intake valve closes. This straighter port compared to this will stack up the flow. It'll recover much quicker. 
Whereas here, once it depletes it, it didn't deplete it good enough because it's slower. Now, as soon as the valve closes up, it stacks up real slow compared to this. So even though this is 340, 360 CFM, this is 283, but when you look at the recovery column that's stored in there before the intake valve opens up, it's probably, I won't be surprised if it's double what this is producing. So really, it's 283 plus, let's say, plus let's say whatever number that is compared to that. Okay, you can easily see the 340, 360 in combination with this. Flow benches perform an intake port evaluation for this guy and that guy. But it doesn't evaluate what this guy's doing with the whole process. And the, the flow bench doesn't have the capability to shut the valve real quick and measure how fast this port recovers and stacks the flow how far it stacks it, how much, okay? You can never do that with a flow bench. As soon as you, you shut it off, and how are you gonna do it? How fast can you follow the recovery rate? And also here, probably a lot less. Now, when you have two cylinder heads, let's just take this for example, okay? Let's just say this is 400 CFM. And then you also have another one that's 400 CFM. But that other 400 CFM head, let's say 400 CFM for, for both of them, okay? But one is up by a significant amount of horsepower and the other one's down. More likely when you look, this recovery rate, maybe the one flowing the same amount doesn't have a, an effective port recovery characteristics it probably recovers partially, not fully as the other one is. And also, how good is that exhaust? And how it reflects that incoming charge? And how it reflects that pull? If the port recovery is less, okay, it doesn't stack it as good as the other one, even though it's flowing the same amount, 400 CFM. And the exhaust isn't as efficient and as good to reflect the yanking uh, uh, signal to the intake as good then your recovery rate is down and then your your cross signal intake to exhaust your overlap is also inferior that's what why that head did not perform okay and if you could possibly plug this head to the block and pull on there and measure their respective uh, uh, cross signal, I bet you the one that's flowing a lot quicker or a lot more between overlaps and you're pulling a lot more effectively will pull a lot more on the real running engine. But if it's pulling a lot less, same thing, the signal will be a lot less. There's a point, okay, you can't go too much. So anyway, so identical flowing heads, that's possibly to inferior Port recovery and also the relationship between the two intake and exhaust during overlap. How strong is that signal to yank the intake into the cylinder? So those two. And I think uh, um, I would like to see what you guys think All right, about port recovery and how it plays into the equation. So like I said, uh, it always also baffled me for a long time ago. Wow, both heads flowed the same, but that other one just really kicked some butt and just beat the other one silly at the racetrack. Port recovery, folks. I would put that more number one before I'd point at the signal of a, a very effective exhaust to the intake column and how it reflects that pulling uh, intensity into the actual uh, process journal overlap I would say port recovery is number one anyway guys I uh, hope you subscribe so I can keep this going and I hope this is a little bit clear <laughs> it's already uh, one o'clock our time and uh, 
I've had uh, a rough day and uh, I'm doing this late while everybody's asleep. So anyway, thanks guys. And uh, please subscribe to Ben Alimi The Racing. And uh, next one I'll talk about uh, combustion chamber and possibly why I want this at 53 to 55%, okay? On all out cylinder heads, not like here. Just because you have a race head or whatever and it's, it's about 75, 80% intake to exhaust. And then now on this new, new uh, cylinder heads, you think you have 75% too? You don't want to do that. You lose all your dynamic uh, charge into the cylinder out the exhaust. So you want to limit that to 53 to 55%, but that'll be for another time. So anyway, uh, good night guys. And uh, hopefully uh, I get a lot of response from you guys and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, thank you. God bless. Bye-bye.